my name is Stefan Zeiger. I uh, work for a light band and I'm on the Scala compiler team. And my current task is working on the new collections library that is supposed to end up in Scala 2.13 and in Dotty. So uh, since those who cannot remember the past are apparently condemned to repeat it, maybe we should start with a short history lesson and look at the previous and current iterations of the Scala collections library so we know what kind of design challenges they encountered and how we're going to improve upon them. So let's start in the Dark Ages, which was before uh, Scala 2.8, where the motto was, do whatever Java does, but in a better way, Java with lambdas. So this is how it looked like in Scala 2.7. We have a trade Scala.iterable. It has a single abstract method that gives you an iterator, and a lot of concrete methods like is empty, map, and drop while. I uh, selected those three for a specific reason, because uh, we basically have three different kinds of methods in defined on collection types. First, there are the simple methods that return some fixed return type, which is unrelated to the collection type. For example, is empty always gives you a boolean. Then we have uh, methods that, uh, like drop while, give you a subset of the current collection. So if we define that on an iterable of A, we expect to get another iterable of A. Well, in this case, it's actually a collection of A, but that's just a subtype which knows its size, can almost be ignored in this uh, collections design. And thirdly, we have a kind of method that for uh, a collection of type A gives you a new collection of type B. So you want to change the element type, for example, in map. And we need to, need to uh, treat those methods differently if we want to get the design right. In Scala 2.7, we also have uh, a trade iterator of A, which is uh, completely unrelated to the other collection type. So you see it doesn't extend anything. There's no common abstraction. And it has the usual has next and next methods that you need to implement. And it also defines a bunch of concrete methods, which all return another iterator. There, there was no, uh, no shared uh, implementation with iterable for those. And then, of course, you have traits like uh, Scala collection set, map, sorted, sorted, map, sorted, set, and so on. These just add some extra methods, which make sense for the specific collection type to read data. And then those are further refined into the immutable and mutable types and the implementations and so on. But I, I don't want to go into those details. We also have Scala collection.jcl, which are wrappers for Java collections, to make Java collections look like uh, Scala collections, except they don't have exactly the same semantics. So in retrospect, uh, that was considered not to be a good idea and uh, removed in the redesign. So um, to show you what the problem with this early design is, let's look at Scala collection immutable sorted set. It extends Scala collection sorted set with immutable set, and it overrides uh, a few of its methods. For example, plus, plus, and plus. Those are the concatenation methods. And they're overwritten to return a sorted set of A. So what happens to all the other methods that are not overwritten? Well, they will return whatever was declared in the supertype. So if you call drop while on a hash set, you get an iterable. Is it backed by a set? Is it backed by a vector or what else? You don't know. If you call map on a tree set, you'll get an iterable. And if you call whatever method you want on a bit set, you will get something other than a bit set back. So this problem only shows up when you uh, look at immutable collections. It, it's quite similar to Java's design, and for Java it works well, because Java only has mutable collections. We will never construct a new collection like this. You only change the existing one. But it doesn't work very well for mutable collections, for, for immutable collections, so it had to be changed. So we're moving on to the industrial age with steam engines and can build from, which was the big new thing. Java as Scala 2.8 got a complete redesign of the collections library. And the first thing you'll notice is that the inheritance hierarchy now starts at a trait called traversable once. So why is it called traversable? 
because it uh, uses internal rather than external iteration. So there's, there's no way to get an iterator from a traversable. You can only call for each on it and have it iterate internally over whatever method you pass to it. And uh, it's also traversable once because you only guarantee that you can do a single traversal. This means we can use it to abstract over iterators as well, which will be exhausted after a traversal. And then it has many uh, concrete methods that are implemented on, uh, in terms of for each, like, like the size method you see there. So, so you can see uh, here, here we're iterating over this current collection, and that's all we need for size. And then, of course, iterator can extend traversable ones. That's the point of it. And then we have a, another subtrait called traversable, which, as you may have guessed, uh, requires that you can traverse it multiple times. And it's, it's implemented in terms of two helper traits called traversable-like and generic traversable-template. Both are parameterized by, uh, the, by the element type, and traversable-like also takes uh, the specific collection type, in this case traversable of A, whereas generic traversable-template takes the type constructor, which is just traversable. So let's look at the second one first. So here's generic traversable-template, and it adds the notion of a builder. So every collection type knows its companion object, which is this uh, generic companion here. And using the companion object, we can get a generic builder. So for every element type B, we can get a builder that allows us to build a new CC of B. And you can see it used down here in flatten. We call a generic builder of B to get a new builder, and then we append stuff to the builder, and in the end we call result and get a cc of b out of it. One limitation of this design is that building this way is necessarily strict. So if you want a collection type like stream, which is lazy, it doesn't work for that. That means all your default implementations that you have in traits like generic traversable templates are not usable for implementing stream. So stream has to override pretty much every single method there is in the collections library. So the, the other helper trait is traversable-like, and it has this wrapper type here, which is traversable-A in our case, so that's the specific collection type, as we're calling it now. And uh, implementations of methods are again based on builders, because everything is mixed together in the end. And you can see in the case of drop while, we're returning a wrapper. So that's the case where we're just returning a subset of the current collection. So we always get the most specific type wrapper. And it also contains methods like map, which are even more flexible than the previous mechanisms. So you can see map has a type parameter that, and it returns a value of type that, whatever it is. It's not constrained by what map does, it actually is computed through an implicit called can build from. So whatever type your wrapper and your B element type is, you have to find an implicit can build from which will then tell you what kind of collection you built. This can build from again gives you a builder and you append to it in a strict way and get the result. But uh, the signature looks rather complicated and it's, it's really hard to get the implementation right. Uh, because you need to ensure that you always get one most specific can build from for, for each combination you may want of wrapper, B and that. You don't want any ambiguities there, you need to get the priorities right. So it, it's, it's a real mess in the implementation. So with these two helpers, no actually we already had traversable, let's move on to iterable. So iterable looks almost like traversable, we repeat the same story here. We have iterable extends traversable with generic traversable template with iterable like. So we, there's no generic iterable template because we don't need it, but we have, a gen, we have an iterable like which extends traversable like. And uh, you can see that for both of these, we're doing a covariant refinement on uh, the second type parameter. So instead of traversable, we're now passing iterable and instead of a traversable of A, we're passing iterable of A. That means all the methods that previously only returned a traversable now return an iterable, an iterable when you call them on a collection of type iterable. And this is repeated 
all the way down in the collection hierarchy, so we always uh, get a very precise type back. So this, uh, the main thing iterable does through iterable-like is that it adds an iterator method. So now we're back to external iteration. And uh, to, cut the short, uh, to cut the story short, we don't really need the internal iteration. There is not a single collection type that doesn't provide external iteration. So we could have uh, gotten the same result without traversables. So with this new redesign, uh, many questions came up. Maybe the most famous one is whether it's a case of the longest suicide node in history. And this points out specifically the problem with the can build from signatures, because they are very hard to understand for beginners. That's not what you expect a map method to look like. But fortunately, C++ came along and said, hey, it could be worse. <laughs> and Scala was just like, hold my beer. <laughs> I'm adding parallel collections. So the, the, there's nothing wrong per se with parallel collections in Scala. They're, they're perfectly fine. But because uh, Scala broke backwards compatibility in 2.8 with the completely new collections library, uh, uh, it was a requirement that they be integrated in a backwards compatible way. So that, that means the old traversable, iterable, etc. traits had to stay sequential. So if you call map on some iterable, you guarantee that it will run in order and on the same thread. That means we need a new set of traits for the parallel collections, like par iterable, par seek, par set, and so on. For all the different collection types, there's a, there's a new trait. And for these, an operation like map can run on any thread and in any order, depending on the implementation of the parallel collection. And then, of course, you may want to abstract over both. So we add another layer with gen traversable, gen iterable, gen seek, gen set, and so on, which are completely unrelated to any type in Scala collection generic. This contains a template trait that we saw before, which is also very confusing. So, how much do you need to define in order to get to the iterable trait in Scala 2.9 to 2.12? Well, let's take a look. We start with gen traversable ones. Then we have traversable ones extends gen traversable ones. Gen iterable extends gen iterable like with gen traversable with generic traversable template. Generic traversable template extends has new builder. Gen iterable like extends gen traversable like. Gen traversable like extends gen traversable ones with parallelizable. Traversable once extends gen iterable once. Traversable like extends has new builder with filter monadic with traversable once with gen iterable like with parallelizable. Traversable extends traversable like with gen traversable with traversable once with generic traversable template. Iterable like extends equals with traversable like with gen iterable like. And finally, iterable extends traversable with gen iterable with generic traversable template with iterable like. Thank you. So maybe it's time to go back to the drawing board. And this is exactly what happened almost two years ago when Martin opened this uh, issue on the Dadi issue tracker called Wanted Strawman Proposals for New Collections Architecture. And it, it lays out certain requirements for a new collections library. For example, that it should be mostly call, call compatible to the current design so we don't break too much code and it should also be simpler and should ideally be faster but not slower and so on. And uh, this culminated into several strawman proposals iterating on each other, which eventually ended up in our new collection strawman repository, in which the development is currently happening. And this is a, a Scala Center proposal, has been accepted by Scala Center as a Scala Center proposal, so uh, it is partly funded by Scala Center and in part by Lightband, which of course pays for my participation in this project. We're currently cross-building against uh, Scala 2.12, the latest 2.13 milestone and the latest study milestone. I also wanted to, uh, to tell you that we have bootstrapped the Scala compiler on top of the new collections, but I didn't manage to finish it in time for the conference, so I'll, I'll just point you to my work in progress branch here. That's as far as I got. So let's look at the new implementation. We start with a trade iterable once, 
which has a method to get an iterator. So traversable is gone because we didn't really need it. But we have iterable once because we want to abstract over iterator and iterable. So iterable once only allows you to get a single iterator and iterate a single time over it. So now we can define iterator as it extends iterable once with the usual methods. And of course, if you call iterator, it returns itself. We, have, we also have concrete methods there like this drop while. There's currently no uh, shared implementation or, or definition trait between iterator and iterable. This is something we may, may still add before the design is finalized because it could be useful to share some code there. But currently, if you have an iterable once, which could either be a collection or an iterator, you just call dot iterator on it and then use the iterator methods. So in order to define iterable, we use a helper trait called iterable ops. So think of this as a combination of the previous uh, like and uh, generic template classes. It has three type parameters, which are the element type, the type constructor and the specific collection type. There wasn't really any need to split those up into, into different classes or different traits, which is something we initially did even in the new design, but later just simplified it to a single helper trait iterable ops. And we also have factories, which are like the old companion objects. Usually the factory is the companion object, but it doesn't have to be in all cases. And uh, you can see it's an iterable factory of type CC, that's a type constructor. So it allows you to build a new CC of any element type that you want. And the building this time around can be both lazy and strict. Ideally, we want everything to be lazy, at least for the default implementations, so we can easily implement lazy collection types, like stream. We also have two methods called from specific iterable and new specific builder, which are the lazy and strict versions of building not a new CC of A, but a new C, which can be a subtype of CC of A. Think of bit set, for example. C could be bit set, but there's no type constructor for it. So CC would be something like iterable, perhaps. So, uh, we can implement all the, all the three different kinds of methods this way. So uh, in case of size, we just return an int and we do it by getting the iterator and using its length method. The drop while method returns a C, so it calls from specific iterable, whereas the map method calls, returns only a CC of B, so it uses the iterable factory to do that. But in both cases, the way we implement it is through a view. There were views, or I should rather say, there are views in the current collections design, but they are rarely used and, uh, and a bit obscure, so we're removing them. The new views that we'll add are basically reified iterator operations. So you can just uh, chain some lazy operations on top of a collection, uh, which is in the end, independent of whatever collection it started from, it's just a view in every case. And as soon as you call a method that consumes it, like dot iterator or dot for each, uh, these transformations are applied to the resulting iterator. And we use that to implement uh, the defaults of these methods. So both for drop while and for for a map, we just construct a view that does the operation on the view, and then we call from iterable to build another collection out of that. So imagine you're doing this uh, map implementation on a lazy list or a stream. So you, so you don't want to force elements unnecessarily. So if we call, if we create a new view, that's okay. We're not forcing anything. It's just reifying the operation that does the map. And then when you call from iterable, it doesn't force anything either because iterable, from iterable will get an iterator of your view, which doesn't force anything and then use that to lazily build a new stream. So you're only forcing it element by element through the view and back to the original collection once you actually force the element in the result collection. So this can be fully lazy in the default implementation. So with this helper trait in place, we can now define iterable. 
So we have iterable extends iterable iterable once with iterable ops of a comma iterable comma iterable of a. And just as in the previous design, the latter two will be covariantly refined in subtypes. So let's do this in the set subtype. So we have a trait set of a extends iterable of a with set ops of a comma set comma set of a. And of course you can see we're just we're just passing these uh, through here. What you can also see is that uh, set ops mixes in the equals trait. Maybe you noticed it earlier, I had it on the slides but didn't call it out. Equals was mixed into iterable in the current collections. In the new design, uh, iterables in general are not, uh, cannot be compared to each other. So if you have a, a set of a single element and a list of a single element and the elements are the same, then the collections will still not be equal. So equality is defined at the level of seek, set and map. Of course you can check if they contain the same elements in the same order. That's always possible, but if you call equals or hash code, they won't, compare, won't be comparable to each other. There are some additional set-specific methods in there, of course, which we don't really care about here. And we're also introducing a new trait, sorted ops, which has an implicit ordering for its element types. And if we combine these two together, we can now implement a sorted set. So again, we do the same same thing here, sorted set extends set with sorted ops of a comma sorted set comma sorted set of a. So there's one difference here. In sorted set ops, we get an a, a cc, and a c. But in the extends clause here, we don't pass through the cc because that's a sorted set now. It's a sorted set subtype. We cannot build a sorted set of an arbitrary element type, which is exactly what we require in the methods and set ops. In order to build a sorted set, we need an ordering. So that so we have to just be uh, content with uh, building a set in this case. So, of course, we want to be able to build a sorted set. So what do we do? Well, we introduce a new kind of factory. So in addition to the iterable factory, we have a sorted iterable factory, which has the same methods, except they take an extra ordering. And what do we do with methods like map? where we really want to be able to build another sorted set, well, we overload it. So now we have an overload of map, which looks exactly like the, like the old one, except it takes an additional ordering for the new element type. And then we can call sorted from iterable, which uses the sorted iterable factory. So uh, effectively, we have two different map methods in sorted set. And uh, the problem here is that uh, overload resolution cannot distinguish between them because uh, it doesn't take implicits into account. So this is one part uh, that I'm not happy with in the new design, but I think it's, it's the least best, one, least best uh, approach uh, we've come up with to solve this problem. So when you call dot .map on a sorted set, you always need an ordering because it will always build a sorted set. If there's no ordering, it's a compile error. You have to upcast to a set if, in order to call this first method here that, doesn't, that does not uh, take an ordering. It's, it's just in this specific case where this is a problem, we'll, we'll see a more advanced case where it works fine. So let's take a look at this more advanced case, which is bit set. Uh, you will find a lot more bit sets and in, in discussions around uh, collection implementations than have probably ever been used in Scala code. That's just because bit set is a, is a very interesting example because it's not even a type constructor. You have a set of int which has its own type bit set. So we define a trait bit set extends sorted set of int with bit set ops as expected. And bit set ops extends sorted set ops. But of course, the CC type that we pass to sorted set ops has to be sorted set, not bit set, because it's not a type constructor. If you map from a bit set to any other element type, you get back a sorted set. But if you map from a bit set to int values, you want to get back another int, int, uh, int based bit set. That was one of the main motivators for can't build from. 
So how do we solve it now? Well, we add another overload. So now we have an overload of map from int to int, which returns a C, which is a subtype of bit set. So what happens if you try this in uh, Scala 2.11? Well, it doesn't work. Because uh, we generally tend to avoid uh, overloading methods, in particular if, if they're higher order functions, if they take any function parameters, because type inference in Scala up to 2.11 just wasn't prepared to do that. So you get this, this error missing parameter type for expanded function, if you just call res1.map underscore plus one. So uh, the reason is that the, the way overload resolution works in 2.11, so first we determine the applicable overloads by shape, which basically means the number of parameters, and if they are function parameters, they're arity. This doesn't help us, we are still left with both of the applicable ones. The first one is shadowed anyway. So we have to type check their arguments in order to find a matching alternative. So we're trying to type check this lambda underscore plus one without an expected type. And of course, there's no way to type check that without explicitly saying this underscore is supposed to be of type int. So we need some language changes to make that work. And because it was expected that we'll, we're going this route in uh, Scala 2.12, those changes already went into Scala, uh, yeah, we were going this route with the new Strawman collections. Those changes were already implemented in Scala 2.12, so you can already use them now for other stuff. And they were, they were first implemented in Dottie and then ported to Scala 2.12. So the way it works now in 2.12 is that First, we uh, determine the applicable overloads by shape, as before, and you get the same remaining alternatives, which I've written down in this uh, internal uh, method notation that the compiler will spit out in some cases. So the first one is a method that takes a function 1 from int to b and returns a sorted set of b. The second one is a method that takes a function 1 from int to int and returns a bit set. So here's the new part. We now unify the parameter types of any function-like parameter, which is either a function n or a sam type. So this unified type now is a method type with a parameter of type function1 from int to an unknown type. And in order to determine uh, the correct alternative, we can now use this unified type as the expected type for type checking. So now when we're type checking underscore plus one, we're type checking it with the expected type function one of int to unknown. So we know the parameters of type int, so we can now successfully type check this and determine that indeed the second one is the correct alternative, the one that returns a bit set. So let's look at a similar case, uh, the trait map so map extends, you can see map of k comma v. It's, it's, a, it's a binary type constructor now. We have a key and a value type and extends iterable of a tuple of k comma v. That's the same it has always been in the collection, nothing new here. And we added trait map ops as expected, which takes k v map and map of k comma v. So uh, map ops extends iterable ops but of course we cannot pass map as the uh, type constructor to iterable ops because it's now a binary type constructor and not a unary type constructor. So instead we're passing iterable. So when you call map.map, .map, map to whatever, you'll get back an iterable. So how do we get back a map? We do the same thing as for sorted sets and bit sets. We add a new kind of factory, which is called map factory, which takes this binary type constructor CC and we also have a map from iterable which can be implemented in terms of this factory. And in order to make this work with the map method, we add another overload. So pay attention to this here. This is not a, a function with two uh, parameters. It's actually a tupled function. So it has the, the same argument type as the, the original map function, but now we return a tuple and then you get back a map. So if, if we look at uh, a summary here, we see that map has the following map methods. It inherits the one from a tuple of k comma v to some type b, and then we get back an iterable of b, and it has a new one from uh, of tuple of k 
k comma v to another tuple of k2 comma v2, in which case we want to return a map of k2 comma v2. And overload resolution for this works the same as in the bit set example. Both these, uh, these parameter types here are identical, so they can be used in overload resolution, which means we get the expected type, method type of one uh, parameter of type function one of tuple of k comma v to unknown and we can successfully type check any application of this and determine the correct overload. So this is what we already have in 2.12. In 2.13 and then uh, also ported to Dadi, we have two new changes. The first one is that in addition to function n and sam types, we also support partial function for this uh, new unification. This is useful, for example, in the collect method, because it takes a partial function. We want to be able to overload that, so we need partial function support. And uh, in a similar spirit, we also want to be able to use uh, pattern matching anonymous functions or case literals to define partial functions. Like uh, when you call map on a map, you want to use something like case tuple of k comma v in order to uh, destructure that uh, key value pair. So we also implemented support for that, which means uh, in an overloaded case, partial functions uh, are always treated as tupled functions. And while we're on the topic of language changes, there's one uh, new uh, data structure coming up in the new collections, which is called lazy list, and it replaces stream. The difference is that stream was only lazy in the tail and lazy list is also uh, lazy in the head. So the, there's a problem though. If you, if you have an expression like this one, you see these, uh, these operators here. They're uh, right associative operators and the way that, that the sugaring for those is currently defined in Scala makes it impossible to have by name arguments. The arguments are always forced there's a neat trick using, uh, using implicits uh, to make this work in the current library, but it doesn't help for the very first one in the chain. This expert one here will still be forced, so we need a, a more principled solution, which means changing the desugaring of uh, right associative operators. And I created a SIP for that, which is currently under consideration, so I hope we can also get that into Scala 2.13 to make this part work. So, what about can build from? Can you still has built from? And do you really need it? Well, there's something similar. There are actually a few similar types we have. First, uh, let's look at a Scala 212 example. The to method, when you call like access dot to, and then in square brackets list. This uh, takes a can build from which uh, allows you to build whatever collection type you want, just based uh, on the type, uh, just based on the, uh, on the type constructor you give it. So uh, one serious limitation here is that if you base it on the type constructor, it only works for, for collections of kind star to star. So you can say to list, but you cannot say to map because map has a, a binary type constructor. You cannot say to bit set because bit set is a concrete collection type. It's not a type constructor. What we're doing instead is this, in the strawman is uh, to require you to pass the companion object to this method. And in this case, we don't have any limitations regarding uh, uh, the type constructors or the arities there. We can implement it in whatever way we want. We can even overload it when we need to, which doesn't really work with, uh, with type uh, parameter inference, with type constructor inference. So there, there we have this new trait called uh, can build. And uh, the trick here is that the companion objects have an implicit conversion to can build. So uh, instead of saying, like list from specific iter uh, list from iterable access, we can say access to list. That's that's all there is, but it allows us to write two. And there's another important use case for for can build from. There's a, an open pull request against Scala currently, 
which uh, proposed to improve the future dot traverse method, which currently returns uh, something like an iterable or at least something with a unary type constructor in every case. And uh, this change here allows you to traverse on a map and get back another map if you call if you pass collection dot breakout this special magical syntax of can build from to uh, to compute whatever type you want. So can we do this in a new design? Well, it turns out we can. First of all, the, of course, there's the obvious choice. We do the same thing we do for all the methods we define inside the collections, which is overloading. With our improvements that we've done to overloading, that's possible. So uh, you don't have to pay attention to all the line noise here in these implementations, which are of uh, option sequencing, not future traversal. Future traversal, but it's it's the same problem basically. The the interesting part here is we have one overload that takes an iterable ops, and we have another overload that takes this sorted set with sorted set ops. So so these two overloads cover the iterable and sorted iterable cases. If you want to make it work for maps as well, you also need to cover map and sorted map. So we have four basic uh, cases here, and you don't really want to write down four versions of this. It, it gets rather ugly. So instead, there's a type called built from, which looks almost exactly like the old can build from. Maybe we'll rename it back to can build from. The main difference is the implementation, though. Whereas can build from is deeply integrated into the library with implicits everywhere in the companion object, you only have four implicits for can build uh, for built from, and they are defined in the companion object of built from. So there's never a any ambiguity, just four instances for the four different collection kinds. So uh, here's a single implementation, and you don't even need uh, collection.breakout anymore because we also have implicit conversions from the companion object, the same as for can build. So if you want to option sequence and get back a tree map, instead of relying on the, on the uh, compiler to infer a build from for some appropriate type, you just tell it which type you want by passing uh, the companion object. That's all I have, so I'm happy to take uh, your questions now. Yes? Uh, will you be doing any kind of map or filter fusion like in Paul Phillips' collection library? Okay, will we, do, will we be doing any kind of map or filter fusion? It's um, not necessarily on the, on the main agenda for a 2.13, so we're concentrating on porting the old functionality, but the new view design uh, would support this, so it can be added at a later point because views are always just uh, reified iter oper iterator operations, they would support uh, fusion. So this is, if you want, uh, want to contribute that on top of views, go ahead, pull requests are welcome. Otherwise, it will probably have to wait a bit until after 2.13. So why is the library Uh, it's, it's not, why is the library named Strawman? That's because uh, Martin was asking for Strawman proposals.